I first started hearing about the low code, no code movement, maybe like five or seven years ago. And I remember like, I, I was like, clutch my pearls, how, how, how very dare. Like, are, they, are they coming for my job? <laughs> right. Should I like learn to train elephants? I don't know. Hey everyone, I'm Lacey Kessler. I think I've said that before, but what I haven't said is that I'm joined today with Arquay Harris. Arquay is the VP of Engineering here at Webflow. She's joining us to talk about her experience in tech and what her role is like as VP of Engineering. Before we jump into it, I need to tell you more about this phenomenal woman sitting across from me. Arquay has worked at companies like Slack, Google, and CBS. And if that's not enough, she's been featured in Forbes and is a respected engineering leader and literally has a Wikipedia page. Arque, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad to, to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We are really excited to get started with this. So I'm really curious. You're a VP of engineering. Mm -hmm. Tell me about when you were younger. What was the first web project that you ever created? Probably after high school, maybe like early college, I made just like a personal website kind of thing, Arquay's portfolio. And it was with tables, <laughs> which is really, and I was so proud of it because it was horrible, but it was like where you could make a layout using nested tables and okay. it took forever to load. Uh -huh. And I like that you could take this, this markup language, quote code, mm -hmm. and make something visual and beautiful. And that's really interesting because you have your Master's of Fine Arts, mm -hmm. correct? So where did coding come into your journey? I had gotten introduced to Illustrator and Photoshop for an after school job. And that was taking art and creativity and adding this kind of digital digital technology element. I got into coding because I would make all of these things, I would design these layouts, and I would have to hand it off to someone mm -hmm. else to code because I didn't know how to code at mm -hmm. that point. And I just thought, I can do this. This is not that hard. Other people can learn a thing. I can learn a thing. They're right. not magic. Right. Um, so I started doing um, Flash, which um, had this language that went along with it called ActionScript. Right. And at the time, ActionScript is basically JavaScript like in terms of syntax and form. And so that's really how I got into coding. Uh -huh. And then you didn't ask this, but I went on to do MFA because it was more common to be like developer designer and mm. to kind of have that hybrid job. And uh -huh. I really wanted to be good at both of those things. Uh -huh. And so the coding kind of continued. So I started doing Flash and I moved on to PHP and Python. Did you feel like there was a steep learning curve going from like more design focus to coding focused? So this is interesting. I'm going to sort of like take a take a detour. It's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. So if you look back to the people who were the early developers, it was mostly women, mm -hmm. right? They were even called computers. If you mm -hmm. look at movies like Hidden Figures and all of that. And so it was very common for women to have that jobs, those jobs. And then it changed, right? It changed around the 80s. And the reason why it changed was because you had things like Revenge of the Nerds or Weird Science or all of these kind of pop culture references that made it seem like coding was for for, for dudes mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. particularly like kind of geeky white dudes, yeah. right? Yeah. And so then you get into the space where you just think, well, that's not for me. Like, that's really hard. Like, oh my goodness, it's this really impossible thing, mm -hmm. these magical unicorns mm -hmm. you can code. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that the, the transition, it wasn't so much that I couldn't do it um, as it was that I didn't see myself in that space. Mm -hmm. When you look at learning, there is a certain amount of gatekeeping to knowledge mm -hmm. that feeds ego, mm -hmm. right? Where if you if you set up these walls of like, this is really difficult, then it, it, it creates this mythology around a thing. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that in the beginning, it wasn't that I couldn't pick up coding. It was that all the materials that existed to teach people coding were awful, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. right? And so, so you look at it and, you know, people are like, learn coding. We're mm -hmm. going to start with Java, mm -hmm. which is the worst language to learn, right, as a, as a starter language. Um, and so I think, I think, again, like this is why I think, um, you know, these types of organizations, why I think Webflow University, I think all of these things that really kind of challenge that paradigm of learning and, and what it means to be a developer are really important. So it's really interesting that math is your background. Mm -hmm. How much does that play into coding experience? Because I think there's like this perception that you have to be really good at math to be really good at coding? So I, I really do believe that you can um, math and science your way out of poverty, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was something very appealing to me because there is an inherent meritocracy to that mm -hmm. discipline, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it definitely helped 
as I got deeper and deeper into learning to code because there's something, there's there's overlaps, right? Mm -hmm. Problem solving, logic, the ability to understand functions and objects mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that it's necessary. And um, I was talking to a, um, a mutual friend once and he was talking about just coding and, and children learning to code, girls, young girls, mm -hmm. um, everyone, right, mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. And when you're younger, a lot of us probably had a biology lesson where we learned about white blood cells and red blood cells and all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. But very few of us actually grew up to become doctors. Right. But you still learn these things because they're foundational to how the world in general works, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so right now, we're already at the point where every single thing that we do, whether it's ordering food or going out, has some sort of technological underpinning. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that world, understanding how to code, is just understanding the world. And so mm -hmm. I think when you think about something like Webflow, which is really great because, you know, looking at learning differently to, to not that there's just one prototype of person mm -hmm. who has to, like, you have to be a good at math and you mm -hmm. have to, like, love uh, functions and, like, you know, all of these things in order to be a coder. I I think we're really kind of changing that paradigm, and I think it's like long overdue, honestly. Yeah. So when you first got into tech, do you feel like the landscape has changed to now? Oh, absolutely. One of the earliest roles that I had out of a team of maybe 40, mm -hmm. um, I was the only woman. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and out of, I was the only woman and I was only one of two black people, mm -hmm. right? I like to always kind of do this thought exercise where I'll ask, I, I once had a conversation with a white colleague, a white male colleague, and I asked him, I said, imagine if every single day you had to go to work and every single person that you worked with for 15 years was a woman, every one of them. And now imagine that every single one of those women was black, mm -hmm. right? Now, one of two things would happen, right? Either, either you would try your hardest to assimilate, mm -hmm. you like get your hair braided, you try to fit in <laughs> somehow, <laughs> you, you'd be like, I gotta, or, or you would completely lose sense of yourself. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't, you were like, what is insecure? Who are Issa and Ra Molly? I don't understand any of these references. Mm -hmm. What is going on, right? And you would lose sense of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is the reality for a lot of people who look like me in tech, mm -hmm. right? Whether you're a woman, underrepresented gender or underrepresented minority. And so it, it would be a different conversation if, if you know, this was a Twilight interview mm -hmm. and I was 100 years old and I was looking back on my career. No, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't some ancient past. Right. This is like right now. I'm yeah. taking my career. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had to work for 15 years before I ever worked with another black woman. Like that's, that's wow. shocking, right? Yes. And so I think that the landscape is definitely changing and it's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Like I love to see the people coming behind me. And that's why so much of what I do is in service to that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like making it better for the people who came behind me in any way that I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of contributing factors to that, right? Like mm -hmm. it's 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 education, it's making it so that these things are accessible, it's affinity groups, it's community outreach. You know, I think I, I'm a firm believer and if you can't see it, you, mm -hmm. you can't be it. Mm -hmm. And so when I was a kid, there was not people who looked like me doing the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so I, not to go too far off course, but um, growing up kind of inner city, um, I used to, 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 to think about just college, like mm -hmm. going ahead, right? I was a great student, I was like, honor, all the honor rolls, all the things. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when I think about like Harvard or Stanford or something, mm -hmm. I knew that Stanford was a place. I knew that Harvard was a place. Like I knew the moon was a place. Mm -hmm. Like it is mm -hmm. like it is up there in the sky. People go to it. It is not a viable option for me. And if I have never seen a, a, a black VP of engineering or a black female VP of engineering, mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing. It is mm -hmm. not a thing that is approachable to me. And so I really think it's important that we not only outreach to those communities, mm -hmm. but we show them examples of what is possible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And really um, devastating in a way that you worked 15 years, did not work with another black woman. That that seems wrong yeah. in, in so many ways. So are there women or people in positions that you saw yourself over there in like higher up positions, whether they're VPs or, or doing something that really uh, was making an impact on the world that you looked up to? I think that the list is so small. Stacy Brown Philpot, for example, is, is a person who sticks out. Or, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's several people that I could name. This is an interesting question that you ask, right? Because um, I used to give a lot of talks about um, self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you advocate for yourself? Right. 
And I used to always ask people, what is your highest aspiration? Mm-hmm. Right? Not, not what is your five-year plan, but, but what is the highest aspiration mm-hmm. that you see for yourself? Mm-hmm. And for me, when people would ask, I, I would never say, that my highest aspiration is to be VP of engineering or, mm-hmm. or CTO or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Because, because truly and honestly, my vision of what that was, it meant Andy Grove, who was like, you know, the CTO of, of Intel. Yeah. He wore khaki pants, blue shirt, middle-aged white guy, mm-hmm. right? And I just never thought that that was a thing that I could do, mm-hmm. right? And so I think what changed later was not only seeing um, women, but women of color doing it their way. Mm-hmm. Right. Like not like you don't have to fit into this mold. Khaki pants are optional. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can wear, you know, what, mileage may vary. Right. Um, but but just like seeing those those examples w- was really meaningful to me. Um, and then also really kind of making the decision that I could do it my way. Mm-hmm. There is this woman that I met. Her name is Shelly Archambault. And she was one of the first black CEOs. And I had a conversation with her and I said, you know, I'm really, I'm really debating, should I do this VP thing? I'm not sure. And she said the most amazingly insightful thing. She said, just try it. If you don't like it, do something else. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do it forever. And I was like, obviously, but it never yeah. occurred to me. It's yeah. always like, oh, I went down this path and I gotta go all the way down the road. I can't turn yeah. back. Right. And that's just not the reality. So I think just really all, it's, it's like kind of mental hurdle that we mm-hmm. talked about with the coding thing. It's really just changing your perception um, of what it is that you want to do and how you see the world. Absolutely. And that's really interesting that you can you can try something and no harm, no foul. Exactly. So given that the tech landscape has changed from when you first got into tech to now, mm-hmm. how important or how much more important do you think that diversity is? Countless studies have been done about the importance of diverse teams and just the um, impact that that has on the final output. Mm-hmm. And I remember this really great story. I had a conversation once with, or, or Scott I was in a conversation. <laughs> Scott Forstall was talking about, um, he worked at Apple for many years and he worked on the early, one of the early iPhones. And he talks about how they had spent, you know, months and months in this kind of dark site, like developing this kind of touchscreen iPhone. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, a woman joins their team mm-hmm. and she tries out the prototype and, she, and she's like, this doesn't work at all. Like, I, I, I can't use it. And they had never tried the iPhone with any person who had slightly longer nails. And so it didn't work. Like the actual touch screen didn't work. And they had to literally go back to the drawing board uh-huh. to, to be like, hey, like some people might have even slightly or maybe very long nails. And uh-huh. what does that look like? And how does uh-huh. how does the UI change because of that, right? Uh-huh. Like that's a very small example that seems so obvious. And, and also it's shocking that they had that team for so long and there were no URGs on it as right. well, right? Right. right? And likewise, uh, you know, from a racial standpoint, when you look at things like artificial intelligence and, you know, not having algorithms that account for people with darker skin tones, just that type of diversity and, and voice uh-huh. in these processes that are become going to become so important to the world that we exist. Mm-hmm. You know, people often talk about diversity as it relates to, um, you know, race or gender, mm-hmm. but there's socioeconomic mm-hmm. uh, diversity mm-hmm. and all of these things combined. I think if you had a team that was all different genders and all different races mm-hmm. and they all went to prep school in Harvard, it's mm-hmm. probably not a super diverse team either. Right. right? right. And so I think um, being able to have just different voices at the table mm-hmm. in every way is better, mm-hmm. always leads, leads to better to better impact, better results. And so I think that's why I think it's really great to see young girls looking at these paths that were formerly just kind of closed off to them. Absolutely. And I love that that you mentioned how it's not just diversity in gender mm-hmm. or race. Mm-hmm. It's across the board yeah. and surrounding yourself with people who don't look like you, don't operate like you, and how important that is to really creating like a holistic product or picture, whatever it is that's truly representative of the whole. Mm-hmm. And that's really beautiful when you think about it. I'm like, that's what humankind is. And I love that. I love that so much. So when we're thinking of the the girls who code the program that they're going through right now, mm-hmm. they're learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and they're working towards a capstone project at the end of this that could potentially lead them further down you know, into a tech path, whether that's engineering, product, all the different roles. Are there things that you would say really stand out on a portfolio, on a body of work that you would tell them, like, if you're going to put something in your portfolio, include this? 
in my career, I've spent a lot of times talking to youth groups or to you know organizations like this. And the advice that I always give them, I say, just code. Just do the project. If, if you have to do a website for your mom's Canasta Club, do it, right? Because <laughs> you're gonna learn something, right? Mm -hmm. Like you might not be able to say like, I got paid millions of dollars for this, right. but you probably learned something. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times what happens is people get in their mind this sort of, oh, it has to be, it has to be just this like capstone project. It has mm -hmm. to be perfect. Mm -hmm. No. No, really what we what employers and people who are looking to hire interns and this type of thing are looking for is that you tried, that you learned something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's it's less about like a particular like type of project mm -hmm. and more that you are de you can demonstrate that you learned something. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you're able kind of try different pieces, right? So you'll you'll have people and they'll say, "Oh, I really love video games. I want to I want to design for video games." Mm -hmm. And then they do it and they're like, "This is awful. <laughs> I don't like this at all." Uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. Like maybe they could have been, you know, a really good back-end engineer or front-end or d just did things for web. And so I think that's important also is to really understand that coding isn't just like one thing. There there is a huge spectrum of things that you can do within it. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes what happens is people from marginalized groups, mm -hmm. they'll 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 enter into these um, situations and they'll say, ugh, I, I didn't like that at all. I'm done with coding forever. That's it. Yeah, right. And it's like, well, maybe you like this other thing over here. Maybe mm -hmm. you're more of a front end person, mm -hmm. right? Like, like try to come at it from different angles and seek out people who can potentially help and mentor you if, you're, if possible. So I think it's interesting, something that you didn't say there is that it matters like where your education is from. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about education as it relates to getting into tech. Do you think it's important to have a CS degree? Mm -hmm. Do you think getting that undergrad in, in anything related is important? How do you view that? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I do not have a CS degree, very proudly. Um, and in fact, not only that, but I have an MFA and people probably look at my resume and like, who is this person, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I am so absolutely excited about the time that we live in right now because everything is open. I think the internet has really democratized learning in a way that I haven't seen. So for example, um, in between one of my jobs, so I made an Android app and an iPhone app and I did Backbone and like like uh, React, all the things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I did is I took a lot of classes. Like I took um, an algorithms class at MIT. I took CS50, which is a very famous Harvard intro computer science class. Mm -hmm. all all of those things I did for free. Mm -hmm. I did EDX. I did some of those things are on um, iTunes or is iTunes. Is that right? I, I don't. Apple Music. Sure. Something. I, I got to update my pop culture references. Yeah. <laughs> it, was on, it was on my iPod. I remember. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You still, wait, wait, you still have an iPod? I do not. I was, okay, okay. And okay. you just ruined my joke, Lacey. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, no. I'm joking. But no, but like all these things are free and available. Yeah. And I think whether it's like, you know, Co uh, Code Academy or mm -hmm. Con. Like, and so I think what I look for is distance traveled. Right? Mm -hmm. If you have someone who couldn't afford to go to a four-year university or maybe they were a teacher and then they decided that they wanted to code and they did like a boot camp, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is valid. Right. Mm -hmm. And that and that also, if you go to a, if you have a CS degree, for example, let's say you're learning something like data structures, you, you could learn that over a semester or a quarter versus if you went to a boot camp and for three weeks straight, you did nothing but data structures. Mm -hmm. You're going to know them pretty well mm -hmm. at the end right. of that three weeks. Right. Right? Right. right. A formalized CS degree is great. And I'm not mm -hmm. discouraging that you should sure. you can get that if, if that's an option for you. But it's not an option for everyone. Right. And so that shouldn't discourage a person from going into tech. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's incredibly uh, liberating. And I hope that whoever is like listening to this, watching this, finds that liberating. That there's not a like a one one path fits all, one, yeah. like you have to do it this way, even with your own background, mm -hmm. because you, do, you don't have a CS degree, like you have an MFA, which is like the opposite side of coding. I mean, not, but it is. Yeah. And I love that we've covered how there's not like a direct pipeline into tech, that you can come from many different avenues and end up in some of the wildest places that you probably never anticipated. And I kind of think it's the same thing for being a web developer. Like we have traditional like hand coding development, we have no code, low code, uh, kind of like in this like umbrella of visual development. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on why it's important that these technologies are accessible for everyone. I, I first started hearing about the low code no code movement maybe like five or seven years ago, right? Like just people were just starting to get into it. Mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, you know, as someone who came up in full stack, I, I was like, 
clutch my pearls. How, how, how very dare. Like, are they, are they coming for my job? Or should I like learn to train elephants? I don't know. Like I, you know, it was a whole thing. I wasn't quite sure like what I was, what I was going to do and how I felt about it. Right. Um, and then the more that I learned about it, particularly talking to um, Vlad, the CEO and, and other people, I realized that it's not really about that. It's not about, you know, camp of developers over here and camp of like low code, no code people over there. It's it, That's not the point. It's not warring factions, right? Mm -hmm. What it really is, it is about that democratization. Mm -hmm. It's that you could have someone like a, a nice, like a young 12 year old girl who maybe finds coding too intimidating or doesn't really know anything about it, just wants to kind of, you know, Get get an get an introduction into mm -hmm. to what that world is like, and I think it is it is such a great, almost kind of stepping stone into that world. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that, once I got that, it was like, oh, this is this is about making it so that more people, not less people. It's not about like making it so there's less developers. It's mm -hmm. making it so that more people who wouldn't normally have access and opportunity can kind of get introduced to this world. Like there are some people who maybe could never afford to get a CS degree at a four year university, but they could afford to just kind of play around with Webflow, mm -hmm. right? Like it, mm -hmm. it does open it up and I love that mission statement. And I think that accessibility and that representation is very important. So you view these tools as like they play nice with developers. I do. They're not pitted against each other. I do, absolutely I do. And I think that's, that's the beauty is because the space also is so large, you have some that are more for developers, specifically making internal tools. You have some that are more visual development. Again, it's a huge spectrum mm -hmm. um, of use cases. And I think that's why there's, there's room for everybody. It's all kind of like going towards the same end. Everyone mm -hmm. is looking to create for the web or build native apps or, or something that they, they're looking to put into the world. And they're just taking different avenues and routes to get there. Mm -hmm. But there's no right or wrong. No right or wrong. I love that. I, I think that's awesome. So what would be like a really good characterization of a mentee, of something that it's like, if, if you were to write a list of mm -hmm. things down, like these are some things that would really stand out to you? Yes. I think at the top of that list would be preparation. When you are kind of seeking out mentors and when I'm in relationships, mentor-mentee relationships, I want to make sure that the person on the other side is engaged. They are prepared. Mm -hmm. they, they really have thought about what it is that I can provide for them and how I can help them. The other thing while we're on the subject is having it in your mind of what you want your mentor to help you with, mm -hmm. right? It's similar to if you just went up to someone and said, Lacey, can you give me feedback? And you're like, about what? Mm -hmm. I like your sweater. Like, I, you know, it's like, it could be anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Really focusing it, mm -hmm. saying to your mentor, hey, I'm interested in getting into tech, you know, having some idea of how it is that, that they can help you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd say lastly, um, not being afraid of rejection, right? <laughs> because you're going to ask a bunch of people. Um, some people are going to say yes. Some people are going to very politely decline, right? And not internalizing it. Don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't like you or you did something wrong or, you know, it's just, you know, maybe they just have a lot going on in their lives and they just can't do it. So really just like kind of, you know, realizing that you're going to have to go at it. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board sometimes. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Like mm -hmm. being patient. So do you think there's a proven way to like stand out to be like, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of ways yeah. to be unforgettable and not ways that you should do mm -hmm. things. But are there things <laughs> that, that have worked for you of like, they really got my attention because they did X, Y, Z? Yeah. I think it depends on whether or not um, the program is like a structured, because I've been involved in a lot of programs where it's a structured program, either um, at a place of work or, or a university, right? Like that kind of thing. And maybe there's a pool of candidates mm -hmm. versus just kind of cold outreach, mm -hmm. right? I actually think that cold outreach is very difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> to do, frankly, mm -hmm. because you have some people who... I've met a lot of, of colleagues and executives who just say, I, I've just declared bankruptcy on LinkedIn. Like mm -hmm. they're going to get requests on LinkedIn and they just they just can't look through them all. So they yeah. don't even see them. And then if you have that person's email, they'll sometimes be suspicious. Like, how did this person get my personal email? Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. often that can be a really difficult road. Mm -hmm. That said, what I have seen work is um, let's say that you're a person and you're, you're thinking like, oh, I, I really – need advice on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, asking a person a very focused question, mm -hmm. being like, hey, 
you might not have time to mentor me, but I noticed that you have an MFA. I'm, I have an MFA as well. How did you make the transition into mm -hmm. technology? Mm -hmm. Asking them a very specific question mm -hmm. and getting their feedback on that, mm -hmm. rather than just like, hey, person, I don't know. Um, could we enter into a relationship where you spend two hours with me a month for the next, you know, it's like, that's just a right. lot. It's like, you remember back in the day when you'd meet someone and you'd be at a party and you'd say, oh my gosh, you haven't seen Lost? Mm -hmm. You should watch Lost. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait, that's a seven episode, yeah. seven seasons? You're yeah. asking me to watch 150 hours that's of television? That's commitment. Whoa, <laughs> All right, let's just, can we make a shorter show, right? right. right. So it's that kind of thing where yeah. when you're asking someone for a favor, if you could really focus in and then sometimes maybe your relationship will grow from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. So make your ask very clear. Exactly. That's awesome. So as we've talked through the experiences that you've had, I would love to hear what advice or words of wisdom you have for the people in this room who are considering tech or just about their career path. You know, it's sometimes at 12 to 18, it seems like if you make a decision, you're stuck with it and that you can't deviate or change. So what would you say to them? About six months ago, I gave this talk and it, it talked about how the privilege of risk, right? Mm -hmm. And how growing up, as I mentioned, I grew up pretty humble beginnings, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a lot. Um, and people who come from, from kind of humble backgrounds are, are generally pretty risk averse, mm -hmm. right? Like, cause you have, it's not just the accomplishments that you do or the, the decisions that you make, it's generally an entire community. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, like we're, we're all going to college or we made it out or we, you know, you have a, you're maybe you're an immigrant and you have a family to support or you're the first one, these types of things. And that really kind of, uh, bared heavy on me, and it really kind of shaped a lot of the decisions that I that I would make growing out, uh, growing up. And how, if you, for example, let's say you ha you have means and you are you know white and male and all of these things, you just like you just join a startup, like do a risk, mm -hmm. like do a much stuff because the 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 impact of that just feels lighter. Mm -hmm. And one of my um, friends, his name's Nick Caldwell. He's a very respected um, engineering leader. He gives this talk where he talks about. Um, the risk is is never what, as much as you think, mm -hmm. right? Like we often will will do these things where we think, well, if I, okay, if I right now I'm 12 years old, if I decide that I'm going to be a coder, uh oh, I guess the the next 20 years of my life are mapped out and I can't change, mm -hmm. right? And the risk of doing so just seems so insurmountable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the advice that I would give or is, the the risk is always less than you think. Right. It's 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 not as though you make one decision and every decision after that is predetermined. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, because, you know, underrepresented genders, underrepresented minorities often fall into these categories where, where they are, the, you know, there's trepidation there mm -hmm. because the, the, it's it's like daunting to even entertain these things. And that you feel like when you finally do like, oh, well, there's so few women doing it. There's so much pressure. I'm, I'm one of only like five women in my CS class. Oh, yeah. no. Um, and, and it just, I think, takes some of that pressure off. And I think programs like this are really important because you, you have the freedom and the flexibility to try a bunch of things. Don't be so hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. The weight of the world is not resting on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. It's just code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, if, and if you decide to do it, you can do this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking right at you. Lacey, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Your daughter can do this. All of us can do this. And I think that the more of us who kind of take this path not taken, just the, the richer the world will be just overall. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what to say to that. I'm going to like cry. <laughs> that was <Aww>. beautiful. <laughs> We're done. <laughs>